information when we document our story live on videotape on 25th Street. See? Have no respect for the black man on the 125th Street. You see what I'm saying, brother? That's what we talk about. Our children are technically trained and well employed. I guess that's progress of a sort. Now, let's go to the subject. And the subject for tonight is Are we ready for the 21st century? Now, I could answer the question in the negative and go on home because I know we're not ready and you know we're not ready. But now, that would serve no purpose. I must deal with why, how we got to the point after 500 years of not being ready. And what did we lose that makes us not ready, and how will we get it back? We lost a lot of our mentality. <laughs> Professor Van Sertema said that they locked us in into a 500-year room. They cut us off from the great history we had made before we knew of the existence of Europeans. And he's merely talking about the second great age of grandeur after the first great age of grandeur fell with the fall of Nile Valley civilizations and Egypt. All right, now, I maintain that all history is a current event. And everything that did happen is still happening one way or the other. And to understand why we are not now ready to rule nations, you have to understand what we lost. We lost our religion. We lost our culture. We lost the image of God as a deity looking like ourselves. And we began to think that our best way to survive is to be those things most unlike ourselves. And when you become those things most unlike yourself, the person that you are imitating become your prisoner whether they build a jail or not, and most of the time they do not have to build a jail because the psychological jail of depending on someone else for religion, culture, and image is a more binding jail than any steel can erect for you. How did we become a dependent people from an independent people? Why have so many messengers came among us and we have not heard their message? Why have we started fights where there were no fights? And what we have to do in order to restore ourselves and prepare ourselves for nationhood again, we have to look at the life 
of maybe four men, but principally three. We have to look at their lives irrespective of what religion we belong to or what ideology we belong to and understand that everybody politically, left and right, has got us wrong. And nobody analyzed our case the way it needs to be analyzed. And a lot of the nationalists have used it for opportunism to the right you didn't expect very much. And one of the main reasons why the left have not understood our case is because they've fallen into a trap set by Karl Marx. Religion is the opiate of the people. Religion is not the opiate of the people. On this point, Karl Marx is wrong. Religion can be made the opiate of the people. People can misuse religion to the point where it puts them to sleep. But religion is a revolutionary weapon. And until you understand that it is a revolutionary rep weapon, you will not make the best use of it. Karl Marx's assessment of the world of his day based on what he learned from urban England and urban Germany. And the world is bigger than that. What he said about economics and what he said about class might well be applicable to those societies. But these things are not applicable to non-Western societies where the main factor is not class in economics. The main factor is culture and religion. And this is what is happening inside Russia right now. People revolting not to leave Russia, people who are not anti-Russia, but they are against the suppression of their religion and their basic culture. They were brought into the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics after the revolution, but they wanted to maintain their same religion and their same culture in spite of the fact that Marxism said that religion is the opiate of the people, they want to hold on to that opiate. Now, if we ever become a socialist people, and we would not have to be imitating anyone because we were socialists anyway, all we will be doing is taking back what we had before. I have no question that the world is going socialist. There's no other place for it to go. Capitalism has played itself out. It lacks humanity. It fails to take care of people. It fails to share. There's a terrible imbalance. There's a few men with enough food to feed a thousand and a thousands of people with no food at all. Such a system cannot last indefinitely. The kind of systems that African people, South Sea Island people, and a lot of Asian people lived under <clears throat> were pure sharing societies where each man got according to his needs. This is a pure form of social living that others call socialism. It was communalism that other people later call communism. Because we are afraid of words because the mass media tells us what to be afraid of. We've grown afraid of words and systems that we created without any doctrineering literature around them. As a socialist, Karl Marx was a Johnny come lately. It was old hat. 
We had already created classless societies. We had already created sharing societies. And Europe's intent was to destroy these societies. Now, before going on to what will we have to do in order to prepare for the 21st century, which, is, which will be day before yes, day after yes, tomorrow, it's right on us. Let's see how we got into this trap that we are in, the trap of not being prepared. What are the items we missed? What are the items we still miss? We get hung up with a bag of worms called integration, not knowing that this in part can be annihilation. I know some brothers and sisters stop eating cornbread after integration. <laughs> White folks don't eat cornbread, watch it, they eat cornbread. <laughs> That's imitation and not innovation. Those things dearest to you, those things that sustain you, must be continued. The Jewish people are integrated into the total society. You go to Brandeis, it is clear at Brandeis that you are going to a university that was found by Jews for the best interest of Jews and that it will stay that way. And if you don't like it, let the door hit you. They don't change one iota to suit anybody. Now, if you want to go to the university the way it is, all well and good. But if you want to change it, you've got trouble. They didn't change Einstein Medical School, and they're not going to. These universities are still going to be Zionist universities. I have nothing against that. I can deal with that. But shouldn't we have one or several are all so-called black universities dedicated to black people the world over? How many black universities are teaching in African language? How many black universities have in-depth courses on what happened to Africa? And how many would dare mention our Holocaust that started before? And how many black professors would have enough nerve to say that the people who were trapped into the German Holocaust participated in every aspect of our Holocaust that's still going on, and they're participating in every aspect of it right now. <laughs> who will deal with our sentimental attachment to the Hebrew mystique and how this mystique came into being? During slavery, we wanted to attach ourselves to a people who escaped from something. So we believed the Exodus story more than they, and still do. <laughs> we believe the Hebrew, the story of the Hebrew children in the fire furnace. We believed it more than they, right now. We cannot separate folklore and mythology from truth. Folklore is beautiful. Folklore is essential. Myth is essential to the ego of all people. But myth is not truth. Myth is based on folklore. I grew up believing and reciting the stories of how John the Conqueror because anytime we wanted somebody to do something to a white person and get away with it, you bring in High John the Conqueror. Slapped that man's face, kicked him, and he was begging for mercy. Ran out of the neighborhood. <laughs> we didn't do it, High John did it. <laughs> I'm saying that it is essential that people tell stories that make them feel good about themselves. 
All people tell stories to make them feel good about themselves, but you tell somebody else's story. You haven't told your story yet. But how did you get into the predicament that you're in today where you are totally unprepared to handle a nation? Let's look at South Africa and the whole fight against apartheid. It's a good fight. I've been a part of it for 50 years of my life. What is missing in the fight? The main thing is missing is the fact that apartheid is not what the struggle in South Africa is mainly about. It's about European or white control over the mineral wealth of the world. They must control the platinum. They must control the precious metals. They must control the gold. They must control the diamonds, especially the industrial diamonds. They can Eliminate apartheid tomorrow. Used in the world is the Colorado Schools of Mines in the United States. Not one African student, not one black student studying at the Colorado School of Mines. If you're going to take over South Africa, you got to know how to control the mine. You got to know control the metal. You got to know how to make people safe in going into mines. You got to know how to market the mines. You have to know how to guide the ships across the sea to deliver the, your goods and your property. South Africa is the 12th largest importer of food in the world. A lot of the peaches you buy in cans that came from South Africa. A lot of the lobsters from South Africa, lobster tails. Now, if you're going to take over South Africa, you don't know how to handle the fields, then all you will have to do is to call them back to show you how to do it. How many people do you have who can fix an elevator? What I am talking about tonight is how you lost the concept of controlling a nation. Until you get back the concept of nation formation, and nation management, you're going to have difficulty with or without apartheid. I don't question that apartheid is brutal. I'm fighting it the, the same as everybody else, but I know that's not the whole picture. You have to prepare to control every single item in a nation. that needs to hold that nation together. How many locksmiths do you, you, you got there? People have to be trained in every aspect of nation management, including the sweeping of the street, sewage system, drainage system, water supplies, all of this. This makes up a nation. Now, the black man I want you to look at again because each one in his own way was preparing us for nation management. And had we looked at each one and accepted each one on the basis of his contribution and stopped arguing about who was fighting who, we would have been close to a time where we might have been ready for the 21st century. Let's look at Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and Elijah Muhammad. Why Elijah Muhammad? And you're not a Muslim? That's not even the issue. Elijah Muhammad, like most Muslims, was a disgruntled Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever went to see one of his speeches, if you ever saw Malcolm X at the mosque and go to a Baptist church, you see the response back and forth, a typical Baptist response. They don't let the minister stand there and preach a whole good sermon without letting him know that you're on the mark, brother. You, uh, you know, that's God's word. <laughs> 
goes back and forth. Yeah, brother. Yes, yeah, you, you. That's all right. Make it plain now. <laughs> when you see the same thing happening among Muslims, they've got on a Muslim veneer, just a coat. But beneath it all, they're the same Baptists that they left. They're just angry with the religion of the oppressor. The religion that the oppressor adapted, but never practiced. Now when we go back now and look at Booker T. Washington, look at the school at Tuskegee, he was preparing black people to sustain themselves on a nation basis. You live in a brick house, own a brick yard. Learn how to manage a brick yard. You wear shoes made of leather, learn how to tan leather. Learn how to take leather straight from a cow, tan it and make it into a good shoe. Many students walked to Tuskegee, they were so poor. They walked across three states and got to Tuskegee, they barefooted. And what did Booker T. Washington do? started a shoe repair shop and later a, a shop people showing people how to design shoes. Most of the black orthopedic shoe makers in this country were trained at Tuskegee. I'm talking about the craft that you need in order to run a whole nation. And you got people here with PhDs that couldn't even design a crutch. People with PhDs, technicians, can't even make a carpet. No, can't, can't, can't put the roof on a house. He's got a PhD now, an academic passport. I'm talking about we went wrong educationally. We had wasted too much time in the argument between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. It wasn't an argument at all, but a difference of opinion between two men both of them wanting the same thing in a different way. Booker T. Washington had laid down a concept of self-sustaining, self-reliance that was good then, that is good now, and that will be good all over Africa. This is why he had so much attraction in Africa itself. This is why so many Africans not only attended Tuskegee, but tried to erect schools similar to Tuskegee in Africa itself. And this is why nearly everyone failed because the colonials did not want them to fail. The colonials told Africans, white potatoes will not grow in your country. The British and the Irish was growing most of the white potatoes and so they needed a market. And they used the African market. And the African didn't even grow potatoes which could have easily been grown in his own country. And when we come to Du Bois, we have to take Du Bois the way he was. He was a political animal. And what he was teaching while Booker T. Washington was teaching the structured state, Booker T. Washington, I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois was teaching the political state. I'm saying that it was never a matter then or now as to whether we shall choose Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. Du Bois. It was Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Both of them needed to be taken on their own level. On the level of self-reliance and basic creative education, we take Booker Washington. On the, on the level of the political state, we take W.E.B. Du Bois. There was no contradiction one to the other. Marcus Garvey would broaden the base of all of this by advocating a total relationship of African people throughout the world, the ultimate Pan-Africanist. And he began to prepare us for the 21st century. Elijah Muhammad, disgruntled with the Christian faith that he grew up in because it was the faith of his slave master, turned to Islam. He could have turned to Buddhism or Shantuism or any other religion. He just wanted to belong to a religion that he thought was different from Christianity. Islam is not radically different from Christianity. 
Islam came into being so fast, it had to take a few saints from Zoroaster, a few from Judaism, a few from Christianity. It came into, into, into being so fast, it created very little, if any, original literature. No great poets of consequence. Not until the emergence of the African Anta, still the greatest single poet produced by Islam. A religion that was simplified, and one of the reasons why it could spread so fast. It was very simple, not complicated, no catechism. Then there was a strange kind of a crude equality within this religion. Partners still there. If they're beating you for being an infidel, and if in the midst of this you cry out allegiance to Allah, then they stop beating you and give you the whip they were using on you. Then you take your whip and join another thug and go beat somebody else into submission. equal to the thug who was beating you because you were not a Christian, a Muslim. Now that you're a Muslim, you can go out and beat somebody else. You don't have the same equality in Christianity. You can cry that you're Christian all you want to, but ain't no, two white, no white man going to join you to go beat another white man who's not a Christian. <laughs> ain't going to do it. Now, Elijah Muhammad created a rough-hued Islam that resembles Islam like mist resembles rain. And yet he created a workable Islam that attracted a whole lot of people and made a whole lot of people feel whole again and complete again. People who had given up on themselves began to have faith in themselves again. He made a major contribution to the rescue of thousands of African people who otherwise would not have been rescued. He did not have to steal from the little church or the big church, the little large or the big large. The people out there that he attracted didn't belong to any of it. They were like the locusts that have no king. There was no head to them and they were moving without direction and he gave them direction. Never mind whether he was orthodox or not orthodox. He was orthodox in the sense that he got results and he made people feel whole again, human beings again. And we need to reconsider him whether we like Islam or not. When I discovered universal spirituality, I knew then that I could take or leave any religion on earth and still be as spiritual as any person that walks this earth. All of it belongs to me one way or the other. And I can go in and out of all of it, pick the values and do the criticism. And don't feel bad about any of it at all because I have found my own way to personal salvation. It does not interfere with anyone else's. Every single day of my life, I will try to do something for someone other than myself without expecting any material return. All right. And whoever God is and wherever he is, if I serve his children, that's tantamount to serving him. All right, now, let's look at the world before we had the difficulty, before we were in what Van Sertima called the 500-year room. How did we get into this 500-year room that we are into right now, dependent on other people to do our thinking? What did happen to our minds, but what more important happened to our nations? Let's look at the world 1400 to 1600. This is the 200 year turning point in world history. This 200 year turning point in world history when Europe 
came out of the Middle Ages, came out into the world and wanted to dominate everything. When they were looking for roots to the east, looking for some way to find food, Europe had come out of the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, people poor, land poor, and resource poor. They not only began to colonize the world, they began to colonize information about the world. They colonized education. And then they made us forget what we still have not understood is that education has but one honorable purpose, one alone. Everything else is a waste of time. Education is supposed to train the student to be an honorable handler of power. Any education that fails to teach you how to control power is a waste of your time. If you play the piano well, you are controlling power. You're controlling the tune. You're controlling the direction. You're controlling the melody of it. You're bringing in the sound when you want it brought in in the manner of your training and choice. So all education that is honest is education for power. We did not see what they were doing to us and we did not see what they were doing to the world. And we did not see then what we still do not see. Powerful people cannot afford to train you in how to take their power away from them. Education for you in the Western world is a contradiction in terms. If you can't teach that child how to go into the classroom and understand what that bigoted teacher is saying, and that's bigoted most of the time, because the black teachers rapidly are disappearing and many of them in the classroom are not teaching from an Afrocentric point of view. But Western education is from a Eurocentric point of view, a point of view that favors Europe at the expense of the rest of the world. Now, in spite of the fact that they are digging up more and more information and more and more white scholars are admitting that Greece was a myth, there was great civilization before Greece, and that Greece was really a bar, a stepchild of Nile Valley civilization. Most Europeans still hang on to the Greek myth. Now, in the 15th, in the 16th century, when they moved out into the world, they were looking for honorable trade. But they discovered or believed that they could get more out of the world through slavery. And they turned honorable trade into the slave trade. Let's examine each one of those, those centers, then come to the present and see what we're going to do or have to do in the present, in the uh, present time, in order to rectify the situation. because. Next week, my notes, my subject will be notes for an African revolution. I'll just do a whole lot of dreaming. I'll plan how to change the world right before your eyes and hope that you can believe some of it. <laughs> but let's look at the changing of our world. Egypt had fallen and was bastardized and still is. We have not dealt with bastardization as an aspect of conquest. We have not dealt with sexual conquest. We have not dealt 
with the use and the misuse of the African woman in relationship to conquerors. We have not dealt with the fact that no conqueror brings civilization. They bring their way of life and they call it civilization. No people ever spread any civilization anywhere at any time. People spread their way of life. And the European came spreading his way of life. He began having colonized history. He colonized an item that still got us trapped. He colonized the image of God. And he began to change the image from black to white. And this took place after the conference at Nicaea, 332 AD. Up to this point, Europeans were basically ignorant of what Christianity was. They're basically ignorant of it now. Because yes, they cannot separate Christianity from Christendom. <laughs> Temples were not something that you went to a certain day of the week. It was there all of the time. It was, religion was, a spirituality was the all-encompassing influence in your total existence, even determine your diet sometimes. The European developed a political instrument that I call Christodom, an instrument to justify and rationalize their control of the world. You have to read some books on the conference at Nicaea and the conflict between Europeans and Europeans. And the certain books in the Bible they couldn't deal with. And so they put them on top of a table and they left the room and they said the books that God wanted us to deal with will be on top. And those that God don't want us to be deal with will be gone in the morning. <laughs> this is the origin of the so-called lost books of the Bible. They lost the books that did not say what they wanted said. Especially the book of Mary, which deals with the Immaculate Conception. And they gave the concept of the Immaculate Conception an interpretation that is still basically in error. The African today will see a woman whose reputation is good, whose word is good, and though she might have nine children, he would say that her reputation is pure, her scrapes are clean, she speaks the truth. Her mouth is sweet. She is virgin. And that's virgin in the African sense, pure of reputation. That her character has not been violated by fraud. She's got nine children. But all of those nine came from an honorable man. She has an honorable relationship. And that relationship was established in full presence of the total community and respected by the total community. He hadn't played around, she ain't played around. She is pure and her, all of her birth are immaculate conceptions. Because she has no question about who the father is. He has no, no, no question about who, whether he is the father. There's no rumor about her doing anything impure. There's no proof that she ever broke a word. She is virgin in as much as her reputation is clear and clean. And that's the African meaning of it. And the European had to create another meaning. He also had to look at cultures as something that he created and that other people did not know how to create. And he refused to recognize those things in the society that spell culture for other people 
and he began to co-opt other people's culture wares as his own, while the African was playing with his cultural toys. He was creating a concept of culture that related to his conquest. All of this happened in that first century, the 15th. When we go to the 16th, the indentured service system changed to the chattel slavery system. Father Bartholomew de las Casas had already gone to Rome and asked permission to increase the Africans, especially in the West Indies. And he would say later in his diary, from 12 to 25 million Indians, so-called, was killed. Christopher Columbus is the one that went to Father de las Casas, asking for the increase in the African slave trade. And this increase in the African slave trade was supposed to save the Indians. He wanted an Indian in the first place. Christopher Columbus started off to the East Indies, ended up in the West Indies, and slapped the, the word Indian on people. Alwak, cabs, people of this nature. Whole Indian nations in the West Indies. You can't find the descendants of 10 pure Indians, West, West Indian Indians, today. And I've looked from island to island where people say that we've got some authentic ones over here. I haven't found any of the authentic ones, any place. But the disappearance of these people in the 16th century brought us to the 17th century when England is now into the trade and has made the trade a business and, and no longer a sloppy business, but a business where the slave stock on the exchange market in England, where absentee ship owners are buying up ships and because of the different profit, the, the volume of profit, many times the Owners of the ship never saw the ship. That business hired a sea captain, hired a bunch of thugs, and they went out to Africa to capture some slaves. Because they made tremendous profit from this. They did not deal with the fact that many of the sea captains were also thugs. They would load on, say, 350 slaves. They would write 300 in the law. They would stop at a port and sell 50, put that in their pocket, in the pockets of the other thugs on the ship. Now these statistics are getting lost. This is our Holocaust now. Now when we start our account, we started at 60 million, and we're just beginning to count. 60, not six. What you have to understand is what our Holocaust was and what their Holocaust was. Their Holocaust was European racism had spent itself out inside of Europe, turned inward on itself. It was a terrible family dispute. So was the French Revolution, it wasn't a revolution at all. So was the American Revolution, not a revolution at all. But a dispute between two branches of the family over who will control, the young one and the old one. The French Revolution was a dispute between two levels of aristocrats. And because the working class people saw these aristocrats chopping off each other's head, they had the illusion that this was being done for them. The condition of the French working class did not improve one iota because of the French Revolution. Now when we come to the 18th century, new civilization, new ways of life was being developed in the Americas, the Caribbean islands, and eventually in the United States. But the United States is not in existence uh, until a little later. Whole new ways of life, African being in the United States, except in New Orleans, being stripped of his Africanness, his African religion, his African gods. All these things are now being taken away from the African. 
his basic African values are being taken away. And yet in the West Indies and in South America, they managed to hold on to more than in the United States, principally because of the buying habits. Now, <clears throat> when we come to the 19th century, we need to pause because this is the beginning of the Pan-African age. This is the time when Africans the world over began to try to reclaim their African self. This is the period of the great slave revolts in the Caribbean islands, especially Jamaica and in Haiti. Period of the revolts in Brazil, Palmares, and uh, Bahia. Period of the last aspect, aspect of the Bubbies revolt in what is now Guyana. The period of the so-called Bush Negro revolt, not only throughout the Guyanas, but throughout the top of South America. Period of escaped slaves and the independent blacks in the Caribbean Islands and in the United States. The period when Prince Hall would bring into being the Black Masons, he called the African Lodge. The period of cooperation between Caribbean freedom fighters and Black American freedom fighters. The period when the British technician in the West Indies would either lose out or die out and the local African technician would come into ascendancy, being skilled in the fixing of mills and wheels, sugar mills and the like, wagon masters. This is the beginning of the Caribbean free man. Now making an alliance with the black American free man in New England. This is how Prince Hall from Barbados got here, Peter Ogden from Antigua, who found the odd fellows, Charles B. John B. Ruswam, another Jamaican, one of the editors of Freedom Journal, Robert Campbell, another Jamaican who went with Martin Delaney to search for a place for the settlement. And yet, it is in the 19th century that African people the world over began to try to claim, reclaim their concept of nationhood. Because this is something we would lose in the 20th century, and this is something we are confused about right now. Whether we shall be a part of something that belongs to others, or establish something that is distinctly our own. When we were confused on that point, we were confused about nations, and we were ill-preparing ourselves to behave in the 21st century that is soon, that will soon be upon us. We began to lose the concept of the formation of our nation, concurrent with the migration movement to Liberia, the claiming of Liberia, concurrent with the nationhood movements in the Caribbean, principally Haiti, principally Jamaica. When we began to lose all of this, we began to use, lose the framework of nation. We stopped visualizing ourselves as the rulers of something. And yet that 19th century, African all over the world was still the finest caliber of dedicated freedom fighters we have produced outside of Africa. Jamaica fought harder than Haiti and did not become free, principally because of who the Jamaicans were fighting and the British could free soldiers to stop the Jamaicans. And they could destabilize the fight in Jamaica and they would use something in Jamaica they are still using in spite of over 20 years of independence still being used. The color factor. The factor of the bastard who had not made up his mind whether he's going to choose his father's side or his mother's side. Lacking commitment to the common people in Jamaica, he sided with the slave master and began to try to make a deal 
And find, when finally the British would not accept the, that deal, a lot of fierce radicals came out of this group. Then England learned her lesson and began to cater to them. And now catering to them, they began to turn away from the blacks and find a separate bastardized society that still exists. We couldn't do that in the United States because this cruel white man in the United States put every black and fragment of black and almost whites in one bag and put one word on the bag and you know what that word was. <laughs> lightest of the lights, if they had one drop of us, had to live among the blackest of the blacks. And when we came to the end of the 19th century, all over the world, 100 years of freedom fighting in Africa was behind them. Now the missionary trained African is coming to power, being heard, not coming to any power, coming to some public acceptance. This missionary trained African having lost his African concept of culture, his African concept of religion, is now appealing to the conscience of the European, the Christian conscience, not knowing that European is not a Christian and therefore not obligated to a Christian conscience that he didn't have in the first place. But because we are true believers, we out Pope to Pope and out Muhammad Muhammad. We believed in it. We believe in democracy. We still do. I remember my father once when he made $18. That's the largest sum of money he ever made in one week in, in his entire life. And he was lecturing about democracy. If you persevere, if you work hard in this country, and if you obey the law, you will make it. Look what a man can do in one week. Eighteen dollars. <laughs> and I counted it. I tried to forget the scene. Tried to forget the lecture. And one day down in Texas, I gave a birthday party for some nice looking tall brown frame. <laughs> Rented a nightclub. Tipped the maitre d' fifty-seven dollars. I thought of my father. If you persevere, if you work hard in this country, obey the law, you will make it in this country. You might even make eighteen dollars in one week. And why did I have enough money to rent a nightclub for some girl I hadn't even made it with? <laughs> Cutting the crap game. <laughs> Learn to be a crook for the first time in my life. <laughs> money in every pot. Contradicts his democratic principles, his concept of hard work, the richest people in the United States does not work hard. And I have thought about this a great deal in the last few years because I go down a path that I deliberately chose. And this path has not been materially rewarding, but it has been rewarding in many ways, both culturally and spiritually. It has taught me some things about myself and my people I never knew. It has made me straighten up myself and clean up my act and realize that I do not act or walk this earth for myself alone. I represent a collective. And what I do reflects on a whole people. So I have to think twice about what I do. I have never met a rich man, and I've met many, who had a much be a better mind than I have. I have met many, and if being rich had been my goal, I think I could have done a good job of it. 
I don't think John Johnson of Ebony, whose last reserve count, that was five years ago, he had $147 million in the bank. I mean, this is money you've already earned and paid taxes on and soaked away. Now, that's what we call reserve. I don't think John Johnson is one might smug, one might better, one might wiser than I am. In fact, in many ways, I think he's an idiot. He could have built one of the greatest black publishing companies in the history of the world. He could have stretched black publications. He could have explained black history in such a way that wouldn't be anybody in the entire world, any black person in the world, in doubt about his heritage. Amen. He had the facility to do it, yet he didn't do it. He copped out for commercialism. He thought this would lose him the Chesterfield ad and the Lucky Stripe ad and the Clarol ad. Look at the direction he's went. Look at why is that now. Evan is practically no longer worth reading. There's not a single article of substance in the last two years' issues. Not a single article of substance. Who's sleeping with who? What stars? Stars got what cars? Nothing. All right, now let's go back to something we have to seriously think about. And it is the most serious thing we have to think about the most serious thing in our life is how we will structure nation. Because we can make a deal with the United States right now. We can make a deal with the world. It'll be a good deal and we'll, we'll get something out of it. All we have to do is to agree to be second best everything. All we have to do is to leave that first slot alone. We would be a good second best. We would be a well-treated second best. So long as people can be secure in the feeling that the best will always belong to them and that we will aspire to nothing higher than the second best. We could have peace. People will adore us, dress us well, make way for us, so long as we don't contest for the first slot. And the first slot means to control a nation. So long as we don't contest for that. Now you may not be for or Jesse Jackson or not, but the one thing he has done in spite of all of the other things he could have done, he has made a bid for the top slot in the controlling of a nation, and he has let both black and whites know that they have the same oppressor, and that the same person that oppress us will oppress them, and that a political coalition is possible that can change this country and the world around, and they have nothing to lose but their subservience. Now, he is not asking whites to like blacks or black to like whites. But he said, if we're all poor together, we're all oppressed together, at least put your political strength together and change the situation. The best thing he has done is to deliver a message. And that message will hold whether he wins or loses. And we are not so naive as to think that anybody is going to let a black man rule this country. Ain't going to let a chromo, people whose name in with I and O not going to rule either. <laughs> Jews not going to rule either. Women not going to rule either. This country was found for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing status quo and who owned property. That's who owned it in the beginning, and that's who owned it now. That's who controlled it in the beginning, and that's who controlled it now. And they intend to forever keep it that way. 
There are other white groups, alleged white groups, who are servants to the Gentiles, being a servant to him, who earns you a good position in the second slot of power, but not the actual real power itself that rests, or meant to rest, with white Protestant males of the lower, of the middle and upper class. Now, you, can't, you can mention Kennedy as a Catholic and mention others. I don't think it's impossible to elect a Jew as president of the United States. But that Jew will have to make peace with that group to the extent that he will do that bidding. There were three great black emperors in the Roman Empire. They rule, they rule exceptionally well. September Savius is a good emperor. So was his son Caracalla. But they ruled according to the law laid down by the Romans. There were three popes in the Holy Roman Empire. They were as credible as any other popes. But they ruled in accordance with the laws laid down by the other cardinals and bishops in the Roman Empire. I'm saying that the Roman black emperors did not rule for blacks, and the Roman black popes did not rule for blacks. They ruled in the name of Rome. You can be anything in the power structure if you agree to maintain the structure as laid down by white male Protestants. The white woman got vote in the United States day before yesterday. When she got the vote, having used every kind of trickery, every kind of persuasion going, she got a vote when she got it across to the white man in a country where no white women can vote, some black men can vote. Then she got the vote on the backs of black men. And right now, she's been given jobs that are being taken from black men. The war has always been on the manhood of a people. Otherwise, there's no way to oppress them. Now, as we enter the 20th century all over the world, when other people were preparing for nationhood, we were preparing to be accepted by our oppressor. The great culture continuity coming from Africa had been lost in the West Indies by now. It was a sustaining force until the end of the 19th century. It's now lost. They're becoming Britishers. British manners, British education, British aspiration. They're not asking for a nation, they assume they already got one. And this assumption was a mistake then, it's a mistake now. That a controlled nation is not a nation, a sovereign nation. And it's still controlled. In Africa, the missionary trained Africans, the Western educated Africans, were not asking for nationhood. They were asking for acceptance within the strata of the colonial system. In this country, where we were making so many demands in the 19th century, early in the 20th century, the end of the Booker T. Washington era, we began to ask for white acceptance. We didn't ask, what, what is the condition of your house? Is your house a clean house? Is your house a moral house? All we ask, let us in the house. <laughs> and did not know that we had a better house. We were asking for entry into a house whose religion was open to question, whose morality was open for question, and whose basic honesty was open for question. Was then and still is. 
we were not asking for nationhood anymore. Liberia had been established, a sick nation then, a sick nation now. The internal integration movement, settlement movement under Chief Sam, Pap Singleton was over. We had thrown in the towel. We, we had conceded that we were not going to be a nation. We just asking for entrance to somebody else's nation without asking about the condition of the nation that we are integrating into or the terms of integration. Just get, let me in. The missionary trained African was asking basically the same thing. He was trying to be like an Englishman, like a Frenchman, like a Portuguese, like whoever was controlling him. The Caribbean, they were becoming British, mainly, or Spanish. In the United States, we wanted to be Americans. We wanted everything the rest of America had. And we quite forget that Amer the rest of America had many things that wasn't good for them and not good for us. Wasn't good then, not good now. But we could have collectively all over the world asked for a new social order. As for what I heard in an African female meeting that was not called female lib because they already thought that they were liberated. So what she said that we are not anti-men. We love men and wouldn't dare live without them. But what we are calling for is to renegotiate the terms of our relationship. And what we should have done in the early part of the 20th century is to ask for a renegotiation of the terms of our relationship. And what we need to do right now in the Caribbean Islands, if the Caribbean Federation had succeeded, you put all of the Caribbean Islands together. You got almost as many people as France. You could have had an Air Force. You could have had a unified defense an economic system, a unified economic system, embracing all of the islands as against one of them going it by themselves. There have been no invasion of Grenada because this would have been unthinkable. The hustler from Boston would not be in charge of Jamaica. And you wouldn't have to have this rationale, but he's Lebanese in color, that's a lie. Call him color and he'll hit you. You would not have been confused over this statement in Jamaica, out of many comes one. That's all right so long as you're clear about who that one is and how that one's supposed to look. That one's supposed to look like me with the stamp of Africa on his face. Out of many can come one, but you better be clear about who that one is. Now, in this country, Early in the century, our organizations wanted to stop lynching. They wanted to stop segregation. They wanted to be a part of the action without understanding the meaning of the action. And in Africa, we came into the 20th century, but with a slightly different kind of approach. They were asking colonialists to give them the opportunity to prepare themselves to be independent. I want to prepare myself to be like you. Instead of preparing myself to be like what I used to be, a total self-sustaining African nation. Now, if we are going to get ready for the 21st century, we have to begin to think over the things we have forgotten as a people. Nation formation. We have to look at other nations and what they did. And we have to do some things without necessarily imitating them all the way. We have to study the rise of modern Japan. It didn't even have a decent wheelbarrow 200 years ago. Now look at them. What did it for them? The will, 
study, a unifying culture, and a need to show other people that they can be self-sustaining and would be self-sustaining, that they could learn anything that was necessary to be learned in order to sustain themselves as a nation. Militarily, as early as 1905, they had stood up to Japan, stood up to Russia, and defeated her. Now their spirit was good, and they're on their way. They would send their children to the leading schools of the world and bring back the technology, and they would combine that and add some creativity of, them, of their own and create enough technology to take on the United States in the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Now, I am not dealing with the rightness and the wrongness of their action. I am dealing with the fact that their action proved that they understood the thing that we still have to understand, nation formation and nation management. That we have to have the will, we have to have the intent. We cannot start silly arguments about how it should go. Certain cases right now is telling us something about our leadership, our loyalty one to the other, and our need for white people's approval that is so utterly tragic and how many times to get his approval we will turn on each other because it becomes a need that we have not satisfied internally. We have not dealt with the fact that ego starvation is one of the greatest crises among us. I have said jokingly we need to form a hugging brigade. See a depressed brother, give him a big hug. One sister told me, that ain't going to work. He might end up hugging the wrong man, and the sister might get killed. <laughs> <laughs> so this, that, that won't work. The hugging brigade idea has to go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought it was a pretty good idea. Some of us, so, so ego stars. We are down breath most of the time. I'm saying that what is lacking and what you will have to have to regain the concept of nation structure is a love for yourself. People who love themselves do not feed poison in their veins or snort it up their nose. People who love their bodies. People who love their bodies do not do this to their bodies and to pollute their bodies with junk and have to give birth to a defective child. The child becomes the inheritance of your misconceptions of good and what a society needs to be. Now, throughout the world, there are nearly or more than a billion African people. All of the Jewish people in the world are less than half of the black population in the United States. It is no mystery that they get 10 times more aid than all the black nations in the world put together. They got their political thing together, we don't have ours together. What we have to do is to look deep into ourselves. We have to understand what slavery did to us and what oppression did more. It broke up our loyalty system. And it broke up the system when we like what we see in the mirror. When Michael Jackson mutilated his face, Change that beautiful nose, those nice, lush, broad lips into thin, 
Mediterranean type lips. He was saying he don't like what his mother and father did. And when you don't like what your mother and father did for you physically, you are in deep difficulty. This young mixed up kid made us look in the mirror again and realize that we cannot build a world until we like ourselves and like the people we're building the world for. I think we need to start with number one. We need to start with the vast number of African people throughout the world. If we and the Chinese are the only African people in the world that can count a billion people, we need to begin an economic system based on those numbers. Let's build shoes for a billion people. Let's make shirts for a billion people. Let's make the facilities for a billion people. With all the things that need to be done within the African world, we can have full employment for the next 1,000 years, mainly taking care of each other, goods and services for each other. We must stop asking our children what to do. We might have to do the same thing the Japanese did on the Baron Tanaka. He gathered so many Japanese youth together and he looks, oceanography for, for you, medicine for you, engineering for you, di diplomacy for you. He didn't ask, will you please do this? <laughs> he said, you will do this or we as a nation will not survive. All he was doing is telling them to train themselves in nation management. And when they came back, they used the basic culture, the basic image that they had created for themselves to move forward in the world by mastering other people's technique. They learned what we still have to learn. Anything that one human mind can do, another human mind can do. If you're going to make a locomotive, first make a safety pin. And this is where you gain the confidence to ultimately make a locomotive. Then you have to ask yourself, who is going to do it for me? If I don't do it, who is going to do it? And if other people do it for me, what are their terms? And if I don't lack their terms, then the terms that they use to do something for me is a new form of enslavement. You have to start with total mental freedom of a people, restore their confidence, restore their will to do and to apply themselves toward the fulfillment of that will and understand what Franz Fanon has said, in effect, each generation must find its mission. It must fulfill the mission or it must betray the mission. You have to find out what you are going to do, not only for yourself, but for your children and your children still unborn. There is no solution, in my opinion, short of nationhood. There's no solution short of an international application of Pan-Africanism. There is no solution in this country or in this side of the world if we ignore Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and Elijah Muhammad. Now, I can name a hundred other people, but I am focusing on four men whose major emphasis was nation preparation. What you need to do is to look at the great states of the Nile Valley, look at the great states of the Niger, 
River, Male Sangue, Ghana, Male Sangue. These nations lasted for over a thousand years after Egypt has fallen. Then look at Egypt itself. Then look at the structure, the culture structure of the world, mostly taken from now valid civilization. The main thing we have to do is to regain our confidence, regain our will, and say to the world, we are ready to march again to the center stage of power. If we did it once, we will do it again. Thank you. sisters, we come in unity and we leave in unity. Okay. Brother Clark, although it's very warm, has consented to do about 10 or 15 minutes of question and answer. We realize it's very warm, but it's just like home. I know I was born in New York. I just want to remind you before Dr. Clark comes back that we realize that there are many, many things going on, and we're getting hit from all sides, but there's one thing that we must keep remembering, that the Howard Beach case is still going on. Killens, one of the great writers, a great friend of Dr. Clark's, and I'm very happy to see they're doing a tribute to Louis Armstrong and Jazz at last. So it's so a great lineup. Take your children to something wholesome, pull them away from that idiot box, watching all that nonsense, and let them see something wholesome and cultural. And they can, this event is coinciding with the African Peep African Street Festival. And the registration is $15, pre registration is $10. And this is presented and make checks uh, payable to the Cultural Center. Now, these flyers, all these flyers and stuff are on the table. The one thing we always say at the church, often we put these flyers out, and whoever's having these, these affairs, print these flyers, and they don't come free. So we ask that you take them and put them up at your job in your building, or even put it on the side of your car. Let people see. I think the more we become visual to our people, the more our people become involved. That's how they did it to us. Also, now you know about our book market, and the sister Gwen is sitting over here. She has crystal semi-precious semi stones and jewelry. And she's selling, and it's not gold. Now, you know, all of us, our young people are buying gold and don't realize that our brothers are dying digging that gold out of the mines. We wish that you would stop over and see her collection of jewelry. Now I'm going to bring back Dr. Clark for the question and answer. And I'm going to ask again, and this time I'm going to insist. You ask a question, you do not make a statement or try to make another lecture or speech. Because if you do, I'm going to be rude and interrupt you. Agreed? Thank you. Anyone has a question for Dr. Clark? Please stand, raise your hand. Come over here. Come over here. Yes. Good evening, as you say. And uh, a question I'd like you to expound on is something that just happened a moment ago. I went up to get some cold water just as you finish your speech. I looked around. I saw all the brothers here tonight. I said, my gosh, I haven't seen this many brothers in a congregation since I was at Queen's uh, Court or here and when Rosa Parks was here speaking or when you were here last. So my question was, would you expound and maybe clarify uh, the point of us being three things, spiritual, mental, and physical, and somehow on a Sunday, our brothers seem to get away from the spiritual. Wednesday, the place is crowded, what I mean when I'm bringing out. Wednesday, the place is crowded. On Sunday, you may see three or four brothers into a house of worship. 
Well, that's a custom that really started in Europe, leaving the church to the woman and saying that the woman is good for the church, the kitchen, and the bed. This is Hitler's statement, not mine. And I think that's wrong because I think the, if the woman is a part of the totality of the society, the brother is supposed to be part of the same totality. And they're supposed to be here. Now, image-wise, I didn't even know about the church situation because in the few churches of my acquaintanceship, it, it, it balances itself off, although the sisters run the general facilities of the church, but they've always done that in the church in the Western world. Well, they, they don't rule the power, they generally rule the facilities. They're the power behind the throne. Well, I think the brothers like different messages at different times, and, and sometimes the brothers assume that, that they are already spiritual and don't need as much spirituality as others. It's an assumption, but probably not one word of truth in it, but it is an assumption. But I think we need equality in everything. This is, a, this is an action church, and I think in an action church, you need male and female participation on the same level throughout the totality of the activity of the church. I'm afraid I cannot successfully explain the absence of brothers in the spiritual aspect of the church as against the political activist aspect other than the fact that one is attracting them more than the other. But if I think they understood both, one would attract them just as much as the other. No, the book is not in Baltimore, Maryland. It's right here in New York. It's a. <coughs> I just have to get the uh, title, maybe. No, I didn't get the title, but the sister who's doing the work on mutualization of males at different times in the ages found a 10 volume work on castration. And she found documents that in the period when castrated slaves as eunuchs brought a higher market, that most of the castration were done by Jews and Arabs who were in that aspect of, of the slave trade. And that aspect of the slave trade was bringing more money than the normal slave trade at the time. It wouldn't be difficult for me to find the sister and ask her to give me the exact uh, name of the of the volumes because she's right there in Long Island. She's one of the members of Gus Dennis Zulu's group, so it's not she, she wouldn't be difficult to get in touch with. Well, I like for you to get in touch. Well, the next time I'll just ask her for the exact citation, and if I can locate her telephone number among all the papers I have scattered over my desk, because she called me just last week. Okay. Yes. How did the Europeans really get a foothold in Africa when they first came to Africa? Uh, was African civilization and sort of a defined mentality? No. Or, or the good. Good. Um, Africa was taken over principally because the Africans' open mindedness in letting people in, the Africans' traditional hospita hospitality to strangers. No African nation fell because it was in disarray. It fell because they did not understand the entry of the foreigners or the intent of the foreigners. And uh, in West Africa, some of the states along the West, West Coast had difficulty one with the other. At the same time, the states in inner Africa was rather stable. Now, the Arabs had already broken up the great eastern African states uh, by the slave trade. 
In the Ottoman Empire had broken up most of the North African states. At first, South Africa had not been established because South Africa wasn't established until about 1652. But the idea that Africans were in disarray and their countries were on the verge of collapse when the Europeans entered, there's no proof of that at all. Now, while I admit there was some difficulty in the West African states, but the other states were rather stable. While the states in inner West Africa, I'm talking about coastal West Africa, while the states in inner West Africa were rather stable, the states in coastal West Africa were having some difficulties. And also, is there any evidence to uh, confirm the belief that history goes in cycles? Have you found any evidence of that? Well, I have found in my own personal study that that tend to be almost for three and four hundred year cycles of history. But history, you cannot say that history moves in one cycle in favor of one people and against another people. History tends to be what people make it out to be. And history tends to be shaped by your understanding of history. If we understood right now that everywhere the European goes in the world, he wants to rule by any means necessary, and that no matter what his political belief is, no matter what he professes religion is, he wants to be in charge. And that he never shares power with anyone. And that the left shares no more power than the right in that regard. Now when I say this, please bear in mind that for over 50 years of my life I've been a socialist and I intend to remain one. But I have no illusion Racism does not st stop at the door of communism and socialism. A lot of blacks don't understand that. It is unfortunate. They think that once they are socialists in accordance to what white people say, that they eliminate their away from racism. African students have been beaten up on the streets of Russia. Some have been killed. That don't mean that I am no longer a socialist. But I'm no longer their kind of socialist. I'm a socialist looking at the indigenous values of people, the indigenous values that existed before their entry. I think we have to study all of our relationships with people in the world. And just like the African women said in that meeting, it is time that we renegotiate the terms of our relationship with everybody. Personally, inside, um, what, how do you see us as African people dealing with the pseudo kind of organizations that we got, like the OAU and uh, the, the kind of organizations that we have running states in Africa and from the African world? And what do you see as dimensions of this African nation formation thing that you want to think that we should have in the first century? What dimensions do you see taking as far as area and geography? Well, no, I, I see. He's talking about the pseudo-European organizations, such as uh, Organization of African Unity, uh, etc. I'm saying that you can take the idea of an organization of African unity is good. The Arabs have practically destroyed it because where Arabs are concerned, they're not effective and they try to make it ineffective make the whole organization ineffective. You have to take it and make it what you want it to be and what you need it to be. You have to look at other people. One of the reasons why Castro lasted in Cuba is he has Cubanized Marxism. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why it lasts in China, they have Chinese eyes there. We just have to Africanize everything, turn it to, to be what we need it to be. No matter what it says on the paper, what turn it to what we need it to be. I mean, that's the basis of what we have to do. Realize that then we have to stop caring about what other people say when we turn say, things into what we need it to be. They respect their nationalism. We have to demand respect for ours. Last question. For the last five, ten years, I've been hearing white folks try to accuse Africans of, ens of enslaving their own people. Can you expound on that somewhat as to how much activity there was of enslaving our own 
people in as much as whites have accused us of doing it. The transatlantic slave trade was a three continent industry involving the kind of ships Africans did not have, the kind of connections Africans did not have, the kind of guns Africans did not have. The European misinterpretation of internal servitude in Africa has been interpreted as meaning if the slave trade was all right because they were in it too. There is nothing in the African system of internal servitude, and I am not denying its existence, but there is nothing in it that resembles what the Europeans did. The basic fact in the, Europe, in, in the slave trade was the gun. Admittedly, and this, is, this can be proven, some corrupt Africans went into the slave and threatened to kill her if you don't raid the next village and capture some slaves for me. The Africans were caught in a bind. I'm not trying to free the African of everything that he did in the slave trade. But I'm saying that the Africans did nothing in the slave trade to justify a system as massive as this and had no apparatus to bring off a system as, as massive as this. What the Europeans are trying to do is to free themselves of the guilt in the slave trade. And trying to also say that the European who live today, the white person who live today had nothing to do with it. My great, great grandfather. Every white person on the face of the earth benefited by it in some way directly or indirectly, and some still do. Thank you very much, and I, I hope to see you all next week. I have prepared a, an extensive lecture on what can we do about where we are, and I have looked at Pan-Africanism as the only alternative to the disaster that we are, we're into, but we as a people have to look very searchingly at ourselves, spiritually, culturally, financially, and all other angles that we can uh, think, think about. I'm very pleased to return and to return to a good and uh, an exciting audience, and I hope next week we we will uh, be back again. And I don't hope we'll be back, but I'm going to make it my point of being back. Because, <laughs> and after that, I'm going to go to North Carolina to tape some courses on African history for Lester Milton in no, South Carolina.